Hi, my name is Kyle Law, and I'm a technical support specialist here at Profound Logic Software. Today I wanted to go through our grid widgets for you and show you how you can use the grid widget to display your subfiles in your rich display applications. So to start, I have a brand new visual designer here. I'm going to pull out my grid widget from our blueprint widget set here. And as you can see, it's, now that it's here, it's on the screen, I can uh, easily edit a lot of the properties. Like I can add or subtract rows. I can add or remove columns. I can change the column widths. I can change the row heights. I can do a lot of this stuff directly from the canvas here. I can even move columns around. So if I wanted to put this one over here. So there's a lot of things you can quickly do to edit the look of the grid widget directly from the canvas. But what we need to do if we're going to want it to show data is we're going to need to put fields in here. It works almost exactly the same as you would with the green screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an output field. And this output field is bound to an RPG field called field 0001. So if I take that output field widget and I drag it into my column, the first row of my column in my grid here, you'll see it's now going to get repeated along all the rows, exactly the same way it does in the green screen, like if you're developing a green screen with RDI. Um, so now that I have my RPG field here, and you can see it's bound as a 10 length character field, I can use that to now populate my subfile in my rich display screen exactly the same way you would do it with a green screen. And going further with that, you can even check that when I dragged the subfile, the grid widget onto here, it actually added a subfile record format up here. So I just want to go over a couple of the properties of the grid widget that's very important for you when you need to set up your subfiles in your rich display applications. So the first one is this uh, settings over here in the properties window we're going to go under the column called subfile settings and under here you have all of your DDS keywords that you would normally attribute to your subfile and you can sit here and bind them to program variables or just or define some hard-coded values for them and so each of these properties relates to a, a keyword in DDS as you can see as I can scroll through a couple of them you can see what that they're all they're all down here in the description I'm not going to go through every single one but if you are looking for to replicate some sort of function from a DDS keyword in your subfile chances are it's in this setting here in the subfile settings so going through here we have a lot of these ones that are for visual things so like font style a lot of visual elements of the header, the colors of the rows. But the next one that's going to be fairly important is the grid settings. So this is going to be setting a lot of the physical attributes for the grid, like the number of rows, the number of columns, the height, and stuff like that. But what it's also important for is it's going to give us some of our response indicators that we might want to respond, that we might write a bound as well as a lot of our additional features that grid widgets can do now that we're in the browser-based environment. So we'll go over these more later, but this is where you can enable or disable those features depending on the, on the grid you want to show to the end user. So one more area I wanted to show to you is the grid data, which you can see here. This grid data section is actually useful for database driven subfiles which we'll go over more later but that's here it is we're in this properties window and then we have one more that's pretty important and that's the events section here at the end of the properties where we can define a bunch of javascript events for our grid including things like when an element on the row is clicked and what's really nice about this is these JavaScript events will have variables predefined for the event. So in this one, there's a variable called row that's predefined that contains the row number that we clicked on to trigger this JavaScript event. 
So now I want to walk you through a simple program that I set up that uses a subfile. And so I've already got it set up. It's right over here. And you can see I have a subfile with two columns. I've changed the header names. And I have also added two fields on here that I've bound to do to two different variables. So row number will can, is a decimal value floating point. And then our row message is a hundred length character field. And so this simple example is just um, one grid widget and these two uh, output field widgets, which I've now bound to variables. And I can go ahead and show you how this works in a program. So I wrote a simple program to that just displays this subfile and populates it with a little bit of data. And so here's the program here. I'm not going to go over it too much, but it just simply is a loop that will populate from 1 to 50 and put in some text in there. So let's go check out how that program looks when it's running. So let's do a new session here. And I'll let me just log in. I've already set this as my initial program. And there it is. It sets up. It's uh, displaying right here. So we can see now it's filling in my row numbers and my message. And I can use the mouse wheel, mouse wheel to scroll. I can use the scroll bar here to scroll. I can drag it like this. And if I had it set up, uh, it, does, it is set up, I can use the page down and page up keys as well to scroll through my subfile here. So that's a simple subfile. And that one was a load all subfile. But you can you can do page at a time or expanding subfiles too. Anything you can do in a green screen, you can do in the rich display format as well. So earlier, I was talking about a database driven subfile. So this is a subfile that instead of using the RPG code to populate these values. I can run an SQL statement that will automatically populate these values for me. So I actually have another sample program I want to show you here. So this is just the same screen, but I modified it slightly. Now as you can see, I don't have any output fields in here, but I have um, different headers here. And if I go over here and let's look at the grid data, I'm not selected. Oh, am I selected? No, I was not selected grid data. So I'll filter to the grid data now that I'm actually selecting the grid. And you can see I've filled in a couple values here. So I have my my database file is called prod p and I got to make sure that the prod p database is in my library list. So I'm going to go up here to library list and you know what? It's in this pui train library so perfectly. So it's perfect. I have my library list defined for my designer environment so that way when I compile it has access to that library to know what the field definitions are. This is not my library list at runtime. I'll have to set that up later in my RPG code. Uh, so what I have done here is I have my prod p library and I have my database fields. And what's neat about this is now that I have the prod p library defined in my library list, I can actually use this button here, which will bring up a description of my field here that I want to show in my subfile. So instead, maybe I didn't want price and maybe I wanted product description instead. I can just turn them off and on like that. And it'll ask me if I want to update my grid columns. I'll hit yes. And it's hard to tell here, but this now reads product description. But that's it's not going to be interesting in this example. So I'm going to change it back to price. But it's really nice to be able to set up the grid very quickly with this. And then what I'm going to end up doing here is I added some additional selection criteria. So this is going to get added into my SQL statement that's run. And that will modify. So I only want to show records in that database that has an ID of less than 100. So. Now that I have my file completely set up here, I do have it running and I can show you that right here. So over here I have that same file running, that one that we we're just looking at. And as you can see, now that I am scrolling through 
the grid here, you can see that the new product IDs are showing up, the product names are showing up, and the prices are showing up. And this is doing the SQL statement to pull all this value for me. And as if I scroll right on the bottom, you can see it's less than 100, which was defined in my SQL statement there. So that's two simple ways of setting up your grid widget to populate with data. You can do it the traditional subfile way, or you can do it with these um, database-driven SQL ways. So the last thing I wanted to talk to you about today was those additional features I was talking about that are client side facing in the grid it was one of the it was the properties in the grid here for grid settings. In the bottom here, we have a bunch of these grid settings that give a bunch of client facing features that I can enable. So for this grid that I was just looking at before, this one's database driven. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn on a couple of these fields and we'll go through them real quick. So the first one I want to talk about is resizable columns. So let's go ahead and turn that on. Now this will let it make this will let the user be able to resize the columns to the way they think it should look. Next is the there should be movable columns right there. So this will let the user move the columns around to the way they would like. Then we can do hideable columns. So this allows the user to hide columns individually. We can filter on the columns. I'm going to turn that option on. And there's even an event related to when the user tries to filter the grid. We can do find, which will change will allow the user to search the grid for specific options. We can let the user reset everything with the reset option. So this will just reset the grid back to the default state. And then another one that can be pretty interesting is the persist state. So I'm going to turn that one on as well. And what this does is this makes it so that when the user navigates to this grid, it remembers all the changes they made to it previously and will display in that format for them when they first show. All right. And then I also am going to turn on the paging bar. Let's see. It's not showing there. So let's go. That one has its own um, section. So let's go ahead and we're going to turn the paging bar controls on. As you can see, it automatically shows up here. And then I'm also going to do the CSV export and the SLS export as well to add those options to the paging bar down here. And we can check those out as well. So now that I have enabled all these features that we can show off real quick, let's recompile our display so that our program picks it up. Now that our display is recompiled, I'm just going to go ahead and refresh this and start the program up fresh again. And so it is, here it is new, and you can see all the stuff that's now changed here. So I am going to go back up to the top, and you can see now our paging bar controls here work. I can export the data here as an XLS file, but I don't want to, it's just the data, so we don't need to necessarily look at that. You can see it all here. But the other ones we want to show you was the resizable columns. So now that I have enabled resizable columns, the user can go in here and resize the columns to whatever they think should be the way it looks. So in this case, it was kind of cutting off a little bit of the stuff. So if I resize it, now it's going to be a little bit bigger and I can start seeing more of the data that's in here. The other ones were movable columns. So instead of resizing the columns, maybe the user wants to see the price next before they want to see the product name. So now they can click and drag the price column around and reorganize the grid to the way they enjoy seeing it. In addition to that, we talked about hideable columns. So if I right click here, we can see a lot of these options I enabled here. So I'm going to go to the display columns here, and maybe the user doesn't want to see the price anymore. I can go ahead and just check that off, and now the price column doesn't even show on this um, subfile anymore. 
In addition to the, dis the hideable columns, we were shocking about the filtering columns. So say if I wanted to filter product IDs to only have product IDs that contain the number five in them. Now I'm only showing all the products that have a five in the product ID, just like that. In addition, we can do something like find. So if we go to find, instead I want to find the product with ID number 55. And it'll scroll to it and highlight it for me like that. So the last one I was talking about was the reset. So that will reset the grid back to the base settings. And the last one after the reset was the persist state. So this lets the user modify the grid. So I can change, like I was doing before, I want the price to show up before the product name. Then when I'm done with this and the user navigates off the screen, the next time they come back to it, so I'm going to simulate that by just refreshing the page. I've left the screen, now I'm coming back to it again. And as you can see, the price actually stayed on the left here. So that way the user can modify the grid the way they like to see it, and it will always show that way for them. So we have a lot of these options that's built into the grid widget. That's something additional you can do with your subfile data. And this works because we're working in a browser-based environment using rich display applications. So the, all of these options I demoed are on the database-driven grid, but they also work on the RPG-driven grid that I showed you in the first example. And so that's the grid widget in Profound UI. And if you have any questions, you're always welcome to contact our support team or you can look on our documentation pages. We have all of this stuff is documented on our documentation pages where you can find more information about what, what these properties are and what they do. In addition to the little data that shows up down here in the designer. So I just want to take this time to thank you everyone for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.